the era of oil is coming to an end. At least, the International Energy Agency believes that we may reach peak oil demand sometime in the 2030s, possibly as early as 2028. But for now, oil prices continue to rise. And do you know why? Because the oil era will never truly end. There is a whole industry in the world that turns black sludge into everything from plastic to the clothes we wear, and from medicines to fertilizers without which we cannot survive. All of this is produced from oil, and it will continue for many decades. Meanwhile, the world is persistently trying to wean itself off the oil addiction. The EU and Japan have pledged that by 2035, all new car sales will be electric, and the two world superpowers, America and China, are spending hundreds of billions of dollars on national renewable energy projects. And this makes sense. You don't need to be a financial analyst to understand that in a couple of decades, we will likely be using less oil than we do now. Simply because oil is not an unlimited resource, and many countries are trying to prepare for this in some way. Now, if this is good news for some, it is a nightmare, or at least a serious challenge, for the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Why? Because Saudi Arabia is not just the holy places of the desert and mosques. It is a country with a lot of oil, an indecent amount, to be honest. Saudi Arabia holds almost one-fifth of all proven oil reserves in the world. Unlike Venezuela, which actually has the largest reserves, Saudi oil is cheap and accessible. The Saudis own the world's largest oil fields, Gawar and Safaniya, and Gawar alone is 174 miles long, 328 feet deep, and provides about 50% of the country's total oil production. This makes the country the second-largest oil producer and the largest oil exporter in the world. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia produces significantly less than it could. Throughout 2020, Saudi Arabia actually cut oil production to raise prices. But by 2022, after reducing production, facing logistical problems, and the conflict in Ukraine, the state oil company reported a staggering profit of $161 billion. An incredible sum. But this is precisely the biggest problem for Saudi Arabia. What is it? They are completely dependent on oil. 40% of their real GDP, 70% of their exports, and about 75% of their government revenues come from oil production. Their well-being depends on the price of oil on the market. Saudi Arabia is a country without income tax and with a very peculiar division of labor, where one-third of the population works under contracts with foreigners, and more than half of working citizens work for the government, and they are entirely dependent on how much oil money comes into their accounts. Imagine, they can produce a barrel of oil for about $4 and sell it for $80. This is a profit of $76 or so, called oil rent. It turns out that Saudi Arabia has a non-functioning economy. Or rather, you could say it's a rentier economy. And that is why, despite the world planning to reduce its dependence on oil, the country is doing two rather strange things. First, they are increasing their oil and gas production, refining, and export capacities of previously untapped reserves. And second, despite the high prices in the early 2020s, they are not in a hurry to spend the crazy amount of money they are earning. They are heavily investing. Why are they doing this? Because the Saudis want to risk their money for a chance to save themselves. Otherwise, they will be forgotten. As you understand, you can't go far by selling sand and camels, and they need to act very quickly. But what are they going to do? Do they have a plan? Yes, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia has a plan, and it is incredibly ambitious. They aim to transform the entire country by 2030. Saudi Arabia wants to develop a non-oil economy, be at the forefront of technology, and have one of the best educational institutions in the world. The country is spending billions on solar and wind energy projects and aims to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. They are also investing in desalination plants and agriculture. And it's working. They want to become a regional hub for finance and logistics with new fintech developments in cities like Riyadh and Jeddah. They are investing in everything related to science, including artificial intelligence, flying cars, and the Saudi Genome Project. They are spending extravagant amounts on building new housing across the country and, most importantly, in their new green capital, Riyadh. They are giving huge sums to everything produced in Saudi Arabia, now in petrochemicals. And most importantly, they are investing in anything that will attract tourists to the country. So, what do you need to attract tourists specifically to you? You need something massive and unique, like the Jeddah Tower, which is projected to be the tallest building in the world once completed. A futuristic city that will function as a ski resort in the middle of the desert. Or a 400-meter high cube housing an eco-friendly mini-city. Or a paradise where you can do anything from a water park to racing on a track, watching any type of sport, or playing games in a sports stadium. And of course, the city of the future, the line. It is a linear city stretching 170 kilometers. 
Well, admit it, it's very cool. But why do they need all this? Because they want the 100 million tourists who, according to their plan, will visit Saudi Arabia annually by 2030 to contribute 10% of their GDP, and they want 1 million citizens to work on these ambitious projects. Of course, Saudi Arabia already has a thriving tourism industry, but it is mainly focused around Mecca, where every Muslim is strongly encouraged to go at least once in their lifetime. It seems complicated and expensive. And it is. But now it's clear how Saudi Arabia plans to reduce its dependence on oil. And it's true. The crown prince himself says that Saudi Arabia suffers from oil addiction, and the main goal of the country is to diversify the economy to ensure against any future oil problems. Moving away from oil is important both for national security and economic growth. But what is the cost of these changes? Well, it's not cheap. We're talking about trillions of dollars. Saudi Arabia plans to create more than half a million government jobs. But there is a problem, government jobs, which are mostly assigned to Saudi citizens at birth, are again subsidized by oil. And this is what they are trying to get rid of. They need to develop the private sector, which, by the way, is growing rapidly and is very profitable. But the problem is that it's unclear which sectors are working and which are not. Why? Because they have so much money that everything seems profitable. For example, the first ever car manufacturer in Saudi Arabia, producing luxury electric cars, is 60% owned by the National Oil Fund. And across the country, about 80% of non-oil growth over the past five years has been due to money from oil sales. So, today the country is still far from financial independence from oil. Thus, the kingdom is in a difficult position. If they do not invest in private business, Saudi workers have no incentive not to just receive their oil rent in a comfortable government job. And if they invest, they are more dependent than ever on oil rent, which flows into everyone's pockets simply because of the country's industrial policy. It turns out that the crown prince needs something else to solve this problem. And here comes Sheikh's team, the public investment fund. This is one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world, which, ironically, may become their ticket out of a rentier economy. It is a diversified portfolio, investing in everything from tech to various companies managing assets worth over $700 billion, approaching $1 trillion. This is one of the main tools Crown Prince Salman is using to push Saudi Arabia off the oil market. And the way it works is relatively simple. Instead of the government spending oil money, always worrying about price fluctuations and production quotas, they transfer most of the profits to this fund, manage the money, let it grow even more, and only then spend it. Thus, money flows into the budget regardless of the current price of oil. This is the best way to spend oil rent on essential needs such as infrastructure, healthcare, and education. The Saudi Arabian royal family is one of the largest domestic and international investors. A new major tech company emerges they are already in the game. Video game companies? They fit the bill. Electric vehicles? They have the funds for that. Travel? They cover that too. Recently, the fund financed a brand new airport and an airline. And do you know where else the Saudi Sheik's money goes? Billions and billions of Saudi oil dollars have flowed into international sports. The fund bought Newcastle United. They own four clubs in the Saudi Professional League. The Saudi Arabian Investment Fund manages three of the largest professional golf leagues. They signed a $200 million annual contract with Ronaldo to play for Al Nasser Football Club. They are hosting the 2027 Asian Cup, the 2034 World Cup, and the 2029 Asian Winter Games. Imagine the Winter Games in Saudi Arabia. Crazy. They have also invested heavily in international tennis, boxing, cricket, MMA, motorsports, and horse racing. Why are they doing this? Maybe to instill a love of sports in the population? No, of course not. It's unlikely you can make an audience love a particular sport, especially if it lacks cultural roots. There's another reason. If sports investments increase the country's GDP by 1%, they will invest in sports. The same goes for other massive, crazy projects they plan. They must be funded by the public investment fund, or they will never be built. They are spending all this money to attract tens of millions of tourists who will come and spend tens of billions of dollars in the country. But what's the point of these insane investments? What will building a giant cube or buying Ronaldo achieve? It's a strange strategy for economic development, isn't it? No. One reason is branding. Brand power is important for both companies and countries. And today, Saudi Arabia doesn't have the best reputation in the world. Here's what most people think of Saudi Arabia. It's a country with a lot of oil, but it's certainly not a must-visit place like Paris or Rome. So, if branding didn't matter for countries, why would millions of people who have never been to Canada immediately move there if given the chance? Because Canada has built a brand of being a relatively safe, open, and wealthy country. 
and it doesn't matter whether that's true or not, it's the brand they sell to the world, and it works. If Saudi Arabia can sell its brand as a top luxury and innovation destination, it can impact their ability to do business with foreigners, attract them, and make everyone remember the name Saudi Arabia. Another reason, their traditional way of life is being disrupted. In an unstable economy, most Saudi citizens were either directly paid from oil extraction or benefited from the development of subsidies and social benefits that oil brought. For this, the royal family gained absolute control over politics, social customs, and much of the economy. But now, with the government openly stating it wants to move away from oil dependence, what happens to this social contract? They are simply creating a new one. Either through rent paid to the government by large sports enterprises or through the brand name and scale of new developments. Look, most Saudis are quite young. Two-thirds of the citizens are under 35 years old. The drive to become a global center for sports, luxury, tourism, or video games is clearly aimed at a young audience looking for vibrant experiences in life. If they can find them without leaving their own country, that's cool. And strict laws are gradually being relaxed. Women can now drive. Cinemas are now open to the public, music can be played loudly in public places, and even alcohol can now be sold. Well, not to everyone, only diplomats and non-Muslims. Here's the key to a successful economy in any state, an educated population and a highly skilled workforce. This is another issue for Saudi Arabia. Saudi citizens find easy jobs in the public sector and lead carefree lives with their wealth. The average Saudi earns about as much as the average Canadian but is less educated than the average citizen of Gabon. And while that might be fine, it's not acceptable for a successful country. 95% of public sector workers are Saudi citizens, but citizens make up only about 17% of the private sector workforce, the rest being foreign contract workers. This is why Saudi Arabia's demographics are so male-dominated. This group makes up the bulk of the country's workforce, so the desire to create a new Saudi Arabia is not just about building a brand, it's about getting its citizens to work in highly skilled areas. But will they really be able to develop skills by pouring endless money into certain industries and praying they create something innovative? That remains a big question. Saudi Arabia needs some measures to determine and understand how well Saudi artificial intelligence, Saudi electric vehicles, or Saudi petrochemicals can perform without government assistance. Their consumption between the public and private sectors is already about three times the global average. With their current employment structure, it would be very difficult to start taxing individuals as the main form of government revenue. So, to move away from a lifestyle let's call it what it is of wealthy idleness by 2030, or more likely sometime after 2030, it will require sacrifices from the citizens. Let's say, they will have to step out of their comfort zone. But the kingdom is not eager for this at all. It clearly remembers the wave of uprisings that swept through Arab states in the early 2010s, toppling four governments in the process. However, if Saudi Arabia can become a highly skilled country with high labor productivity, this program will fully pay off. They might even become one of the first economies to escape the oil curse. And generally, an open society and the construction of large-scale projects are cool, but economies are built by people, not buildings. Whether Saudi Arabia will manage to avoid dependence on oil rent remains unclear. But all we can do is watch and see what they ultimately achieve. Friends, if you like what we do and want to support us, please like and subscribe to our channel. We would really appreciate it. See you next time.